live everywhere. Daily Kos Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kagro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, how you doing, everybody? It is Monday, September 28th, 2020. I am not actually in the studio live, of course, but we are pretending as though I am there. I am otherwise engaged today being Yom Kippur, and a very important day on the religious calendar. And so I've prepared this show for you instead, and I didn't want to leave you hanging on a big news day, and they're all big news days at this point. Uh, wow. <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be such a crazy, crazy weekend. Uh, of course, we knew that the uh, alleged, the purported nomination uh, for the Supreme Court of Amy Coney Barrett was due for Saturday. And they, they did follow through on that. And, and Trump had a, a press conference announcing her nomination and everything. I didn't watch the entirety of it. Maybe you did. Maybe you couldn't stomach it. I don't know. Uh, anybody who did see it, did you? Did he sign anything? Did he actually do the paperwork right then and there? I could see that sort of being the kind of pageantry that he might be interested in pulling off in something like this. But um, yeah, I'm guessing that perhaps uh, they didn't do it there. And, you know, uh, I always like to see the paperwork on these things. And uh, I have no reason to doubt that they will come through with the paperwork in the end. But, you know, I always like to see these things and uh, I like to make him prove that he's doing these things in person. I say make him come to the Capitol. There's a president's room in the Capitol and he can sign the documentation there. Um, And we have seen him walk out of events before forgetting to sign the papers that he is ostensibly present to sign. And we have seen him announce nominations and then not follow up for quite some time with the actual paperwork. I I don't think that he's got any reason to delay. And delay is not his friend in this situation. But he is an awfully dumb person. And the people around him are awfully dumb as well. And you never know exactly what they might forget or not forget to do. And uh, like I said, it always... uh, I I always caution everybody that you should wait for the paperwork on him. And uh, if they don't have it, well, there's your delay built right in. I, I, I certainly have said all along that they ought not to accept paperwork from him on his word or the word of the messenger coming from the White House. If the president has sent us a written communication, uh, so be it. But I don't believe that it's a written communication from the president unless I have some outside proof that he composed it and signed it. And it's a giant pain in the neck. But he's going to have to come here and either tell it to me to my face or sign it in front of me. And until then, I object to the receipt of this purported message from the president of the United States. But no one seems willing to do this. There is word from uh, numerous sources, uh, actually one I have in front of me from Politico, that says that Senate Dems are ready to uh, hit the ground mm, jogging at a moderate pace with some delaying tactics to muck up the Supreme Court confirmation, as it says here in the piece's title in Politico. Shall we go through it before we get to the really, really big and juicy stuff? Why not? Uh, We have to fill our time somehow, don't we? Let's begin with this one, because that's the one I wandered into first. Senate Dems ready tactics to muck up Supreme Court confirmation. And uh, the subheader promises us that here's how Democrats can make life hard for Mitch McConnell. Sounds like a good thing to do. Andrew Desiderio put this collection together. We'll run through it pretty quickly because I think you are aware of a lot of these things, a lot of these delaying tactics we've talked about before. But just to refresh your memory so that you know uh, whether or not you have to complain about the aggressiveness with which they are pursuing these tactics if you are watching proceedings on C-SPAN 2. Senate Democrats can't, it says right up at the top, stop Mitch McConnell from confirming a new Supreme Court justice. It's probably true. Uh, It depends on outside circumstances. But they're already planning to make it as painful as possible. And uh, now's a good time for that. 
Uh, by the way, I don't know if I've if we've gone over this or not, but uh, yeah, it's true that uh, ordinarily there's nothing that they could do under the current rules to stop this nomination if they just feel like ramming it through without spending enough time vetting her or having hearings or any of those things. You don't have to do those things. You can just go right to it if you want to. So it depends how uncomfortable Mitch McConnell becomes uh, deviating from the norm ver um, beyond just hurrying things up. But uh, the reason I am an advocate for these kind of delays is, well, for one thing, that the Senate Republicans absolutely deserve these things. But it really is waiting on a miracle, hoping that something else will happen, an external event of some kind, like, oh, I don't know, the New York Times getting hold of Donald Trump's taxes and that creating such a nightmarish firestorm for him that something, something, something. Now, he's shameless, so it's easy to imagine this, even this rolling off his back, even though he dedicated four years, five years, really, if you count the campaign of his life to preventing these tax returns from coming to light. It may be that he was overreacting the whole time. We'll see. But uh, other things can happen. And, uh, you know, without getting the Secret Service on your back, um, presidents fall down the stairs of Air Force One from time to time. It's been a while since that happened and no major damage was done last time. And probably no major damage would be done now, but uh, hey, you never know what could happen. The presidents, I don't, I don't know. Uh, they could fall down a well. That could happen. I've not seen that happen. I don't think I have any historical precedent for it. It's probably been a very long time since the White House, if it ever did, operated on a well system. Uh, but, uh, you know, he may visit a property with a well and... Just be curious about uh, whether or not he can reach down and scoop the pennies off of the floor or something like that. So I heard kids throw money in there, and I'm, I'm short on cash, according to my tax returns. Anyway, any one of these things uh, leaves open the possibility that something could happen. If, if you're going to have a miracle, you can either wait around and uh, delay things and hope that the miracle comes before the last possible second, or you can say, ah, to hell with it, there's probably no miracle going. Go ahead, rush it through, and then, of course, if a miracle comes, you'll be kicking yourself later on. That's my general philosophy on this. Now, back to the procedure. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer has his caucus on board with an effort to disrupt and obstruct Senate Republicans using a wide range of procedural tools to try to make it difficult for the Senate Majority Leader. After we skip over this lending tree ad, it continues... Interviews with more than a dozen Democratic senators revealed broad support for disrupting the Supreme Court confirmation process, even if the strategy yields some collateral damage. Yet, Democrats facing tough re-elections and those who typically spurn delay tactics overwhelmingly support the hardball campaign, potentially putting them at increased risk, they say, of losing their seats. But we don't believe that that's really true. And uh, when Greg gets back on Wednesday, we'll find out how close to true that might really be. We know that the votes are not there to block the nominee, but you do what you can to call attention to it, said Senator Doug Jones of Alabama, the most vulnerable Democratic incumbent who could be pulled off the campaign trail as a result. This issue, the issue, is that it is a power grab. We can't do business as usual in a situation that's so extraordinary where the Republicans are breaking their word to Russia nominees so they can kill the Affordable Care Act, added Senator Tim Kaine. We can't just say, oh, yeah, that's normal. Sorry. The goals, Senator and senators and aides say, is to highlight what Democrats see as hypocrisy. Not that Republicans care about that, but we see it as, as hypocrisy. That's true. And a blatant abuse of power on the part of McConnell who blocked President Barack Obama's Supreme Court nominee in 2016, but is pressing forward with the goal of confirming President Donald Trump's pick, Amy Coney Barrett, before Election Day. McConnell needs only a simple majority after Republicans eliminated the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees in 2017, and if Democrats can prevent Barrett from being seated on the court before November 10th, she likely wouldn't be able to rule on the Trump administration's effort to invalidate Obamacare. That's an important thing to keep in mind, too. October or rather November 10th is the uh, hearing of the case that would that seeks to have the Affordable Care Act uh, rendered null as unconstitutional. And if she's not on hand for the oral arguments, 
chances are she would not participate in the decision later on. But I don't know if that's necessarily uh, the case either. I suppose if she just wanted to barge into the uh, the discussions, having certainly, I'm sure, read the, the written briefs, uh, I don't know who stops her. But anyway, it's out there. Democratic senators were quick to justify the retaliation effort, which is getting started with less than 40 days until the November 3rd election. Process is everything, said Senator Robert Menendez of New Jersey. So if you're going to use the process to try to steal an election, then we're going to use the process to try to do everything for that not to happen. Some Democrats have already said they will refuse to meet with Barrett. The many... uh, the way many Republicans snubbed Obama's 2016 pick, Merrick Garland. But the party still plans to abide by some norms. Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee have decided to attend the confirmation hearings, despite calls from the left for a boycott. Indeed, McConnell told his members that they should be prepared for such tactics from Democrats, which could complicate campaign schedules for vulnerable Republican incumbents. Here's what Senate Democrats have in their toolkit. And by the way, we might as well just comment on it since it's sitting out there. Uh, There were calls from all over the spectrum for Democrats to boycott the confirmation hearings. I don't think they were all from the left or even all from Democrats. These days, plenty of Republicans oppose the president on this, too. Uh, So here's some of the things in the toolkit here. The two hour rule. Schumer's opening salvo last Tuesday was to invoke the rarely used two-hour rule, which can be used to halt all committee business after the Senate has been in session for more than two hours. The move caught senators and aides by surprise. I can't really believe that's true. And it caused the cancellation of several important committee hearings, most notably a closed Senate Intelligence Committee briefing with William, uh, who is this guy, Evanina. Uh, No, rings no bells for me, but the nation's top counterintelligence official somehow (laughs) on the subject of election security. I have no idea who this guy is. We're just a stupid rotating cast of characters in the Trump administration. Just has me uh, about uh, probably a year or so behind on stupid appointments like this. Republicans quickly derided the move as a temper tantrum on Schumer's part. When Intelligence Committee Chairman Marco Rubio asked for a uh, for a unanimous consent that his panel hold its scheduled session with Evanina, Schumer objected. Because the Senate Republicans have no respect for the institution, we won't have business as usual here in the Senate, Schumer said on the Senate floor. While the move made no difference to Republicans' timeline to confirm a new Supreme Court justice, it was one of several ways Democrats could disrupt the chamber's activity. Perhaps most importantly, When the Judiciary Committee holds its series of confirmation hearings for Barrett in October, the sessions will almost certainly last longer than two hours. Democrats could then invoke the two-hour rule to halt the hearing for the rest of the day. Next up, slowing down legislative business. The Senate can finish up its work on a bill or a nomination quickly with the agreement of all 100 senators, but that rarely happens, and McConnell and Schumer often spend their days haggling over floor time to reach a consent agreement. On Thursday, Democrats refused to give consent for the Senate to quickly pass a government funding bill, requiring McConnell to file cloture and set up a final vote, possibly for as late as Wednesday, just hours before the September 30th deadline. The move also prevents senators up for re-election from campaigning while they tend to Senate business next week. Right now, I think they're just trying to throw a wrench into anything we do. Senate Majority Whip John Thune told reporters. Obviously, it's retribution for the decision on the court, and they just want to be difficult. I don't know why. (laughs) You can't imagine why. It doesn't make sense to me either to bring everybody back next week when we could finish this today. By the way, when was this piece actually written? Um, As I was reading through it here, okay, on the 27th, so Sunday. Uh, I, I was a little bit confused because I thought I saw somewhere along the line on Twitter at some point somebody say that the funding bill was was passed. And I thought that was awfully quick. And maybe it was just that it had been passed in the House and still now awaiting action in the Senate. But, uh, hey, you never know. I guess it's possible that uh, uh, timelines crossed here. All right. Where do we leave off? Oh, a little bit further down. Uh, after the two-hour rule. And, okay, here we are next, objecting to recess. Another trick in the bag here. 
When the Senate concludes its business for the day, it requires the consent of all 100 senators. Any one lawmaker can object to recessing. Democrats could force the chamber to remain in session even when Republicans want to close up shop for the day or for a couple of weeks in October to allow vulnerable incumbents to head home and campaign for re-election in the final stretch before November. Still, even if the Senate doesn't formally recess, individual senators could still leave Washington. Uh, that would, I guess, lead us into this next tactic of denying a quorum. I did have a lot of questions people asked me about whether or not we could deny a quorum to the Republicans. Uh, the problem, of course, is that a quorum in the Senate is just a, a simple majority, 51 senators, and they have that many. Of course, they've got 53. But, uh, well, as they explain in here, it would um, it would put the onus on Republicans to provide that quorum. In order to conduct business, the article explains that the Senate requires a quorum or a majority of senators to be present. Any one senator can, really at any time, move to require a quorum call. If just a few Republicans are absent for any reason, Democrats could boycott the quorum call and effectively prevent the Senate from doing business. That's, uh, like I said, goes hand in hand with objecting to recess. If they were to block a recess, but certain senators said, well, to hell with it, I'm going to go home and campaign anyway, or I'm going to go take care of what other, other business. Uh, all it takes is a couple of them for Democrats, uh, once they get wind of it, to call a quorum call and then refuse to appear on the floor in response to the quorum call. And if a quorum cannot be established, then they do have to uh, they have to adjourn. So that would uh, that would put a, a stop to the process, whether they were considering the nomination or anything else. Next up, points of order and motions to adjourn. Any senator can raise what is dubbed a point of order to ask the presiding officer a procedural question. If the senator disagrees with the presiding officer's ruling, he or she can appeal it and trigger a roll call vote, requiring senators to spend time voting on the objection. Democrats could theoretically do several of these in a row, which could stall proceedings for hours, even days. They can also force a series of votes on motions to adjourn or to recess further occupying valuable floor time and delaying the Senate's business. Uh, next up, get the House on board. There are a number of actions the Democratic-controlled House could take in order to force the Senate to take up unrelated business. One of these, and this one I didn't think of, is a war powers resolution, which, if passed by the House, can be put on the Senate floor even by Democrats who are in the minority. And that's good thinking because... Uh, well, it just is. I mean, it gives you the power to disrupt the Senate schedule um, in ways that I hadn't thought of. I did think of this next suggestion, but they poo-poo that one because it's Politico. Some Democrats uh, floated the unlikely idea of impeaching the president or Attorney General William Barr, which would force the Senate to take up a trial. But the idea quickly fizzled, say they. Uh, and Republicans could simply dismiss the trial altogether. That's not entirely clear, but even in dismissing it, it would take, uh, well, it would take up quite some time and it would be, uh, it would be interesting, of course, to watch, uh, any of them who have any conscience, if there are any, uh, simply dismissing impeachment calls repeatedly, especially if they were actually based on legitimate grievances, uh, but it's not all that clear that they could dismiss it all that quickly without giving the managers the opportunity to present the case or at least to uh, to to uh, demand some floor time to uh, present the case. And I guess they could at that point be denied. But if you just followed it up with another one, and especially if you rotate them with war, war powers resolutions, uh, yeah, that could be pretty interesting. OK, but they don't like the impeachment one. Too bad. Uh, the point is it was real and it can work. That's why they don't like it. Uh, delaying a final committee vote is up next. After the Supreme Court nominees confirmation hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee, any senator can move to delay the final committee vote by a week. That committee vote formally advances the nomination to the Senate floor. Under the current timeline, even if the committee vote is pushed back by a week, the nomination could reach the Senate floor the week before the election. But the Senate could also vote for the nominee in the lame duck session. So that's not so great. But how far are Democrats willing to go? 
Individual senators have been known to cause a procedural fracas here and there on the Senate floor. But if Schumer develops a cohesive strategy and has the support of the entire Senate Democratic caucus, it could quickly become one of the most disruptive series of delay tactics in recent memory. Even Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who voted to confirm Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh and is considered the most conservative Senate Democrat, is on board with Schumer's initial effort. He was quick to justify Schumer's use of the two-hour rule, which halted committee business last Tuesday. Hell, we don't do anything around here anyway. We've got plenty of time to do meetings, Manchin said. They can reschedule. Doesn't make a great deal of sense, but whatever. Uh, Moderate Democratic Senator John Tester of Montana said he doesn't plan to second-guess Schumer, in part because he views the alternative as the destruction of the Senate. I don't know that the Senate will, will ever be what it was once was. Mike Mansfield would be shaking his head today, Tester said in an interview, referring to the longest-serving Senate majority leader. There's no sense of fair play. It's all about power. It's all about retention of power. It's all about screwing people over. Other Democrats said the disrupt and object strategy could prove useful as the party seeks to further highlight the Senate's inaction on pandemic relief which has stalled for weeks after negotiations broke down. We're in the middle of a recession and a pandemic, and apparently he's going to move heaven and earth to ram through a partisan nominee for the court. But there's no time for us to resolve that? Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, a Judiciary Committee member, said in an interview. At the same time, some Democrats are warning that there should be some limits to the dilatory efforts, in particular when it comes to interfering with Senate activity that remains bipartisan, such as the Intelligence Committee briefing that was scrapped last week. You have to be selective about it, Kane said. So that sounds like a Dianne Feinstein concern being relayed by Tim Kane as a favor to her to keep her out of the news, I guess. Uh, he probably agrees to some extent that uh, try to keep those things bipartisan. And uh, Well, they have put out some remarkably bipartisan work product lately, including their reports on the Trump-Russia situation. Uh, Republicans could have objected to that much more strongly. I'm actually very surprised at what they were able to produce there. All right. I think that brings us up to speed, uh, both on the tactics under consideration and what Politico thinks of them. And uh, I think we're less concerned with the second than we are with the first. But as I mentioned, there could be a point to all this. Some ground-shaking earthquake of an event could crop up at any moment that makes it considerably more difficult politically for Trump to move forward. And I believe such an event for a normal president has presented itself. However, he's an abnormal specimen and uh, we'll have to wait and see where this goes. But I think it's got some legs and people will be busy with it for a little while. So let's start with that story next. Actually, you know, before we even get to that, uh, I guess another example of weird one-off black swan events that can arise uh, while you're delaying things in the Senate. I don't think either of these things is really going to disrupt the campaign or the the drive to put uh, Barrett on the court. But just, again, as an example, things that you never really expected to crop up. Uh, In the last couple of days, one, uh, Michael Caputo, You remember him, the uh, spokesperson for HHS, who basically was an evil bastard and uh, was, uh, well, orchestrating all of the most horrible things that HHS had going on, essentially. Uh, But he sort of flipped out and had this almost psychotic episode where he was describing his paranoia living in Washington, D.C., And uh, sending around video to friends saying, uh, in order to stop me, they'll have to kill me. All sorts of, you know, well, literally crazy things. Uh, Well, he has taken medical leave, which we all knew. And and, and there was this weird admission that, yeah, maybe he was having a mental episode, which was causing him to have to take this time out. And as it turns out now, it's more than that. Um, I had a report from the Buffalo News, but of course I got paywalled out of that one. I'm borrowing here from USA Today. HHS spokesperson Michael Caputo diagnosed with cancer after taking medical leave. And it's a fairly serious sounding. I don't know how it goes in terms of treatment, but some sort of metastatic head and neck cancer, which originated in his throat, apparently. And I guess his leave is going to take that much longer. 
and may or may not be related to his mental issues. But uh, I guess we could explore that in uh, more extensively later. But just as an example, I throw that one out. And how about this one? On Sunday, I happened to see in the uh, the Miami uh, Sun Sentinel this crazy story, which all the pop-ups are getting in the way of. Now, former Trump campaign manager and still involved in the campaign, Brad Parscal, hospitalized after he was armed and threatening to harm himself, Fort Lauderdale police say. Uh, I don't even really know what to comment on that. It's just uh, uh, an amazing development. But but again, you just don't know in Trump universe what the hell is going to happen any given moment. And you should take every opportunity to delay things because Trump will drop a gift at your feet without you knowing it or some lightning strikes somewhere. I mean, this is crazy. This actually probably deserves a little bit of time. Of course, we are coming up on our break, but perhaps uh, maybe we could just dip into this story and then continue it on the other side before flipping over to the, the biggest story of the weekend, the tax coverage uh, or the coverage that the Times got for uh, somehow obtaining his uh, Trump's tax returns. But here's the uh, the word from down in Florida, headlined or datelined in Fort Lauderdale. President Trump's former campaign manager, Brad Parscal, was taken from his Fort Lauderdale home by police Sunday afternoon. I always kind of hope for that. But after his wife reported that he was armed and threatening suicide. I don't think anybody was expecting that one. There's more, uh, as a matter of fact. But uh, let's see what we can squeeze in before the break. Police, called by his wife, went to the home in the Seven Isles community, an affluent area in which houses have access to the water. Isn't that where, uh, is that where uh, Trump has those uh, high-rise towers? Hmm. Well, they made contact, developed a rapport, and negotiated his exit from the house, the police said in a statement. He was taken to Broward Mental Health, a Broward Health Medical Center under the Baker Act, which provides for temporary involuntary commitment. Wow. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for K-Grow in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the K-Grow in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that K-Grow in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday, but our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to Patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netflix Radio. Uh, geez, I, I've moved locations in the middle of the taping. Doesn't they sound is very different in my earphones? Well, uh, you let me know whether things change dramatically in the tape for you. But we left off uh, reading about how uh, Brad Parscale was carted away to Broward Health Medical Center under the Baker Act, which provides for temporary involuntary commitment for, uh, well, I guess people who need it, and I guess he does. By the way, uh, Seven Isles is not the same community as the one I was thinking of. It's uh, Sunny Isles. The Sunny Isles community is where Trump has his high-rise towers. Seven Isles is in Fort Lauderdale. Sunny Isles down in, uh, is it Hollywood? area uh, about half an hour uh south of there uh if you're driving through the congested parts of town anyway uh, i don't know so at any rate uh different localities there fort lauderdale police chief karen dietrich said the encounter at the house was brief we went out and it was very short we went and got him help <laughs> okay they're being very curt about that and i don't blame them dietrich said he didn't threaten police, that is, uh, well, of course, Dietrich didn't, and she's a she anyway, but they're talking about Parscale. Didn't threaten police, and he went willingly under Florida's Baker Act. I'm sure that he said, oh, well, the Baker Act, that seems reasonable. Uh, let's go. 
which allows police to detain a person who is potentially a threat to himself or others. Standing a towering six feet eight inches with a striking full beard, Parscale has taken an unusually public role for a campaign manager, speaking at events and developing a prominent media persona. But he was demoted by Trump in July as the president's re-election campaign suffered a series of blows. Uh, I think the whole thing blows, but uh, that's just me. Among these were a campaign rally in Tulsa that was poorly attended, embarrassing the president, who had expected an overflow crowd. Uh, P.S. It killed Herman Cain from COVID, which is exactly what you didn't want to have happen if you were uh, pretending to be in control of the pandemic. But they leave that out for some reason. He's also been sharply criticized by both supporters and opponents of the president over extravagance with campaign money including millions in payments to his own companies. Tim Murtaugh, Trump campaign communications director, issued a statement Sunday night supporting Parscale and blasting his critics. Don't say blasting in the middle of this. Brad Parscale is a member of our family, and we all love him. We are ready to support him and his family in any way possible. The disgusting personal attacks from Democrats and disgruntled rhinos have gone too far. What is he even talking about? No one has attacked him over this, I, I, I guess maybe uh, criticizing him before. Now you're saying it was driving him to suicide. What if it was uh, Trump firing him that was driving him to suicide? But anyway, whatever. The, they're going to make a they're going to make an issue out of this. It's disgusting that anybody would make an issue out of this in the middle of this terrible crisis. So I'm going to do it because I love being disgusting. I guess is what he's saying here. Uh, where were we? Uh, right. Disgusting personal attacks from Democrats and disgruntled rhinos, as, uh, as though that were happening, have gone too far, and they should be ashamed of themselves for what they've done to this man and his family, which really was you. Anyway, Parscal, 44, moved two years ago to Fort Lauderdale, the biggest city in, it doesn't have the, uh, the uh, article, the, in there for some reason, biggest city, it's uh, written by Russians, uh, moved to Two years ago to Fort Lauderdale, biggest city in heavily Democratic Broward County. That's that's the way it reads. Where Trump won 31.4% of the vote in 2016. In an interview with the Sun Sentinel, he explained his move into hostile political territory by invoking his love of boating and the appeal of a state without an income tax. That really doesn't answer the question, but par for the course for Pascal. He could have moved to a conservative section of Florida and indulged his love of boating, but now he's indulging his love of involuntary hospitalization, I guess. Fort Lauderdale Mayor Dean Trantalis said he received a text message saying that there was a SWAT team standoff at Parscale's home. It was indicated to me that he had weapons, Trantalis said, and he did because he's living in Florida. Trantalis could not confirm it was the same Parscale associated with the Trump campaign, but he said he knows Trump's former campaign manager does have a home in Fort Lauderdale. We have a six foot eight bearded guy screaming about Donald Trump, and uh, well, I think it's him. Okay, all the six foot eight people live in in uh, where was it? Seven Isles. Okay. Politics aside, this fellow obviously suffers from emotional distress. Although I think it's because of the politics. Said Trantalis, a Democrat. I'm glad he didn't do any harm to himself or others. I commend our SWAT team for being able to negotiate a peaceful ending to this. Isn't that amazing that they were able to, to make that work this time? A reporter rang the doorbell of the Parscal home on Sunday evening. I wouldn't. No one answered, and as the reporter was walking away, a woman opened the door, looked at him, and closed the door. I probably wouldn't even have included that in the write-up, but uh, they did. Uh, who are they? Austin Erblatt, David Lyons, Brittany Wallman, W-A-L-L-M-A-N, and David Fleschler. So there you go. For the South Florida Sun Sentinel, that's some kind of story. I definitely wasn't expecting that. However, I was sort of expecting the next story, the one I meant to get to uh, earlier in the show, but uh, let's, let's start it now. The president's taxes. I did expect that we would eventually find out something about this. Uh, and here we have it. Trump's taxes show chronic losses and years of income tax avoidance, according to the New York Times, which has somehow gotten a hold of these things. And maybe that's included in the story. Let's let's thumb through it. Uh, long concealed records 
show Trump's chronic losses and years of tax avoidance, illustrated with a gigantic black and white blow up picture of him uh, riding in the gigantic limousine and looking uh, eh, more or less vacantly out the window. The Times obtained Donald Trump's tax information, extending over more than two decades, revealing struggling properties, vast write-offs, an audit battle, and hundreds of millions in debt coming due by Ross Butner, Suzanne Craig, and Mike McIntyre. All right, let's roll. Donald J. Trump paid $750 in federal income taxes this year or rather the year he won the presidency. In his first year in the White House, he paid another, another $750. Wow. That's not how this works! Calm down. It's true. That's not how it works. But uh, that's that's like not a very large amount of money, I would think, for most supposed billionaires. But that's what he happens to have done. He paid no income taxes at all in 10 of the previous 15 years, largely because he reported losing so much more money than he made. We've got to have a businessman in the White House who knows what he's doing and can set this country right, I tell you. Uh, let's see. Uh, he, uh, well, as the president wages a re-election campaign that polls say he is in danger of losing, like all of his money, his finances are under stress, beset by losses and hundreds of millions of dollars in debt coming due, that he is personally guaranteed. What an idiot. Also hanging over him is a decade-long audit battle with the Internal Revenue Service. So there's, there's a reality to that? Wow. Over the legitimacy of a $72.9 million tax refund that he claimed and received after declaring huge losses. Huge losses, as he might have said years ago. An adverse ruling could cost him more than $100 million. Hallelujah. The tax returns that Mr. Trump has long fought to keep private uh, tell a story fundamentally different from the one he has told to the American public. Yes, on, both on television and in his campaigns. Uh, wow, $100 million. I, I, it occurred to me right in the middle of reading that, that was $100 million enough for you if you are sitting there as Donald Trump to say, you know what, I should, I'll run for president, you know? I mean, if I win, I'll, I'll just close the IRS and tell them they can't have this money and I'll fire everybody or I'll arrest them or whatever. Uh, whereas if I lose, uh, which is the far more likely outcome, you know, what's in it for me at this point? I guess I claim to be a political victim that Hillary Clinton uh, is targeting me with the IRS because I'm a political opponent and you try to whip up some sympathy or some grounds to uh, scare the IRS off of uh, trying to collect on this thing. I wonder if, I mean, I don't know if that would have worked, but I wonder if that's what he thought. The tax returns that Mr. Trump has long fought to keep private uh, tell a story fundamentally different from the one he has told the Amer sold sorry, to the American public. He finally sold something here. I should give him credit for it. His reports to the IRS portray a businessman... <laughs> who takes in hundreds of millions of dollars a year, yet racks up chronic losses that he aggressively employs to avoid paying taxes. Now, with his financial challenges mounting, the records show that he depends more and more on making money from businesses that put him in potential and often direct conflict of interest with his job as president, which I guess was always the plan. He wanted to use the presidency to steal and extort money from others. The New York Times has obtained tax return data extending over more than two decades for Mr. Trump and the hundreds of companies that make up his business organization, including detailed information from his first two years in office. It does not include his personal returns for 2018 or 19. Interesting. OK. And I think that's what everybody was was clamoring for the whole time. But uh, this might be the more revealing of uh, of the two. This article offers an overview of the Times' findings, additional articles will be published in the coming weeks. So sort of a drip, drip, drip into the election. How fascinating. The returns are some of the most sought after and speculated about records in recent memory. In Mr. Trump's nearly four years in office and across his endlessly hyped decades in the public eye, journalists, prosecutors, opposition politicians, and conspiracists have, 
with limited success, sought to excavate the enigmas of his finances. By their very nature, the filings will leave many questions unanswered, many questioners unfulfilled. They comprise information that Mr. Trump has disclosed to the IRS, not the findings of an independent financial examination. They report that Mr. Trump owns hundreds of millions of dollars in valuable assets, but they do not reveal his true wealth, nor do they reveal any previously unreported connections to Russia. So in case you were thinking he was going to put that in his taxes, you can lay that to rest. In response to a letter summarizing the Times' findings, Alan Garten, a lawyer for the Trump Organization, said that most, if not all, of the facts appear to be inaccurate and requested the documents on which they were based. After the Times declined to provide the records in order to protect its sources, Mr. Garten took direct issue only with the amount of taxes Mr. Trump had paid. Over the past decade, President Trump has paid tens of millions of dollars in personal taxes to the federal government, including paying millions in personal taxes since announcing his candidacy in 2015, Mr. Garten said in a statement. With the term personal taxes, however, Mr. Garten appears to be conflating income taxes with other federal taxes Mr. Trump has paid, Social Security, Medicare, and taxes for his household employees. Mr. Garten also asserted that some of what the president owed was, quote, paid with tax credits, a misleading characterization of credits which reduce a business owner's income tax bill as a reward for various activities like historic preservation. They're not gift certificates, you see. The tax data examined by the Times provides a roadmap of revelations from write-offs for the cost of a criminal defense lawyer and a mansion used as a family retreat to a full accounting of the millions of dollars the president received from the 2013 Miss Universe pageant in Moscow. Together with related financial documents and legal filings, the records offer the most detailed look yet inside the president's business empire. They reveal the hollowness, but also the wizardry behind the self-made billionaire image honed through his star turn on The Apprentice that helped propel him to the White House and still undergirds the loyalty of many in his base. Ultimately, Mr. Trump has been more successful playing a business mogul than being one in real life. The Apprentice, along with the licensing and endorsement deals that flowed from his expanding celebrity, brought Mr. Trump a total of $427.4 million, the Times analysis of the records found. He invested much of that in a collection of businesses, mostly golf courses, that in the years since have steadily devoured cash, much as the money he secretly received from his father financed a spree of quixotic overspending that led to his collapse in the early 1990s. Did I ever get that pronunciation correct? We'll find out when uh, I'm admonished that I did not. Indeed, his financial condition when he announced his run for president in 2015 lends some credence to the notion that his long-shot campaign was at least in part a gambit to reanimate the marketability of his name. As the legal and political battles over access to his tax returns have intensified, Mr. Trump has often wondered aloud why anyone would even want to see them. There is nothing to learn from them, he told the Associated Press in 2016. There is far more useful information, he has said, in the annual financial disclosures required of him as president, which he has pointed to as evidence of his mastery of a flourishing and immensely profitable business universe. In fact, those public filings offer a distorted picture of his financial state since they simply report revenue, not profit. In 2018, for example, Mr. Trump announced in his disclosure that he had made at least $434.9 million. The tax records deliver a very different portrait of his bottom line, $47.4 million in losses. Tax records do not have the specificity to evaluate the legitimacy of every business expense Mr. Trump claims to reduce his taxable income, for instance, Without any explanation in his returns, the general and administrative expenses of his Bedminster Golf Club in New Jersey increased fivefold from 2016 to 2017. And he has previously bragged that his ability to get by without paying taxes, quote, makes me smart, as he said in 2016. 
But the returns, by his own account, undercut his claims of financial acumen, showing that he is simply pouring more money into many businesses than he is taking out. Just to reemphasize what uh, happened in the early part of that paragraph there, without any explanation, the general and administrative expenses at his Bedminster Golf Club in New Jersey increased fivefold from 2016 to 2017. So one of two things is going on there. Either one, he's just inflating the administrative expenses so that he can show losses and not owe taxes on the revenue from Bedminster, or he is genuinely a terrible person to have as president. You know, we need a businessman in the White House because blah, 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 and he's going to cut expenses and trim the fat, and he knows how to do things lean and mean, right? It's, five-fold increase in his administrative expenses from a golf club that he barely ever goes to for no reason in one year. That's somebody who can't administer things and ought not to be the kind of person you would choose to be president if you wanted a businessman to become president. You would look elsewhere. The picture that perhaps emerges most starkly from the mountain of figures and tax schedules prepared by Mr. Trump's accountants is of a businessman president in a tightening financial vice. Most of Mr. Trump's core enterprises, from his constellation of golf courses to his conservative magnet hotel in Washington, report losing millions, if not tens of millions, of dollars every year, year after year. His revenue from The Apprentice and from licensing deals is drying up, and several years ago, he sold nearly all the stocks that now might have helped him plug holes in his struggling properties. The tax audit looms, and within the next four years, more than $300 million in loans, obligations for which he is personally responsible, it's the party of personal responsibility, the Republicans, will come due. Interesting. So four more years, or maybe more, maybe I should have another term, whatever. So <clears throat> he's, he's going to be on the hook for $300 million in loans personally, and if he's president... <clears throat> He can pretend he's not liable for those things or that they can't come and arrest him or repossess his properties while he's a sitting president or dictator or what have you. And I guess uh, maybe he thinks someone will slip him enough money either through Mar-a-Lago or the hotel or maybe just some Saudis or Qataris will give him the $300 million that he needs uh, if he's president and can do them a favor. I don't know. But uh, he can't go back. Uh, he can't go back to not being in jail or else he'll end up going to jail, you see. Against that backdrop, the records go much further toward revealing the actual and potential conflicts of interest created by Mr. Trump's refusal to divest himself of his business interests while in the White House. His properties have become bazaars for collecting money directly from lobbyists, foreign officials, and others seeking face time, access, or favor. The records for the first time, put precise dollar figures on those transactions. At the Mar-a-Lago Club in Palm Beach, Florida, a flood of new members starting in 2015 allowed him to pocket an additional $5 million a year from the business. In 2017, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association paid at least $397,602, to the Washington Hotel, where the group held at least one event during its four-day World Summit in Defense of Persecuted Christians. What a great summit that was. The Times was also able to take the fullest measure to date of the president's income from overseas, where he holds ultimate sway over American diplomacy. When he took office, Mr. Trump said he would pursue no new foreign deals as president, even so, in his first two years in the White House, his revenue from abroad totaled $73 million. And while much of that money was from his golf properties in Scotland and Ireland, some came from licensing deals in countries with authoritarian-leaning leaders or thorny geopolitics. For example, $3 million from the Philippines, $2.3 million from India, and $1 million from Turkey. He reported paying taxes in turn, on a number of his overseas ventures. In 2017, the president's $750 contribution to the operations of the U.S. government was dwarfed by the $15,598 he or his companies paid in Panama. 
the $145,400 in India, and the $156,824 in the Philippines. Wow, so 145 grand to India, 156 grand to the Philippines, uh, 15 grand to Panama, $750 for us. America first, everybody. Mr. Trump's U.S. payment, after factoring in his losses, was roughly equivalent in dollars not adjusted for inflation to another presidential tax bill revealed nearly a half century before. In 1973, the Providence Journal reported that, after a charitable deduction for donating his presidential papers, Richard M. Nixon had paid $792.81 in 1970 on income of about $200,000. The leak of Mr. Nixon's small tax payment caused a precedent-setting uproar. Henceforth, presidents and presidential candidates would make their tax returns available for the American people to see. What a, what a crazy idea that is, eh? I would love to do that, Mr. Trump said in 2014 when asked whether he would release his taxes if he ran for president. He's been backpedaling ever since. When he ran, he said he might make, make his taxes public if Hillary Clinton did the same with the deleted emails from her private server, an echo of his taunt, while stoking the birther fiction that he might release his, the returns if President Barack Obama released his birth certificate. He once boasted that his tax returns were very big and beautiful. I really don't know why he just misuses the word beautiful all the time and just sticks it in anywhere, just like strongly. Very big and strongly beautiful. But making them public, it's very complicated. He often claims that he cannot do so while under audit, an argument refuted by his own IRS commissioner. When prosecutors and congressional investigators issued subpoenas for his returns, he wielded not just his private lawyers, but also the power of the Justice Department to stalemate them all, uh, oh, to stalemate them all, all the way to the Supreme Court, of course. Should have read that sentence correctly the first time instead. Mr. Trump's elaborate dance and defiance have only stoked suspicion about what secrets might lie hidden in his taxes. There, is there a financial clue to his deference to Russia and its president, Vladimir Putin? Did he write off as a business expense the hush money payment to the pornographic film star Stormy Daniels in the days before the 2016 election? Did a covert source of money feed his frenzy of acquisition that began in the mid-2000s? The Times examined and analyzed the data from thousands of individual and business tax returns for 2000 through 2017, along with additional tax information from other years. The trove included years of employee compensation information and records of cash payments between the president and his businesses, as well as information about ongoing federal audits of his taxes. The article also draws upon dozens of interviews and previously unreported material from other sources, both public and confidential. All of the information the Times obtained was provided by sources with legal access to it, while most of the tax data has not previously been made public, the Times was able to verify portions of it by comparing it with publicly available information and confidential records previously obtained by the Times. To delve into the records is to see up close the complex structure of the president's business interests and the depth of his entanglements. What is popularly known as the Trump Organization is in fact a collection of more than 500 entities, virtually all of them wholly owned by Mr. Trump, many carrying his name. For example, 105 of them are a variation on the name Trump Marks, which he uses for licensing deals. Fragments of Mr. Trump's tax returns have leaked out before. Transcripts of his main federal tax form, the 1040, from 1985 to 1994, were obtained by the Times in 2019. They showed that in many years, Mr. Trump lost more money than nearly any other individual American taxpayer. Put a businessman in the White House. Three pages of his 1995 returns, mailed anonymously to the Times during the 2016 campaign, showed that Mr. Trump had declared losses of $915.7 million, giving him a tax deduction that could have allowed him to avoid federal income taxes for almost two decades. Five months later, the journalist David K. Johnston obtained two pages of Mr. Trump's returns from 2005, that year, his fortunes had rebounded to the point that he was paying taxes. The vast new trove of information 
analyzed by the Times, completes the recurring pattern of ascent and decline that has defined the president's career. Even so, it has its limits. Tax returns do not, for example, record net worth. In Mr. Trump's case, a topic of much posturing and almost as much debate. The documents chart a great churn of money, but while returns report debts, they often do not identify lenders. The data contains no new revelations about the $130,000 payment to Stephanie Clifford, the actress who performs as Stormy Daniels, a focus of the Manhattan District Attorney's subpoena for Mr. Trump's tax returns and other financial information. Mr. Trump has acknowledged reimbursing his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, who made the payoff, but the materials obtained by the Times did not include any itemized payments to Cohen. The amount, however, could have been improperly included in legal fees written off as a business expense, which are not required to be itemized on tax returns. No subject has proved provoked more intense speculation about Mr. Trump's finances than his connection to Russia, while the tax records revealed no previously unknown financial connection and, for the most part, lacked the specificity required to do so, they did shed new light on the money behind the 2013 Miss Universe pageant in Moscow, a subject of enduring intrigue because of subsequent investigations into Russia's interference in the 2016 election. The records show that the pageant was the most profitable Miss Universe during Mr. Trump's time as co-owner and that it generated a personal payday of $2.3 million, made possible at least in part by the Agalarov family, who would later help set up the infamous 2016 meeting between Trump campaign officials seeking dirt on Mrs. Clinton and a Russian lawyer connected to the Kremlin. In August, the Senate Intelligence Committee released a report that looked extensively into the circumstances of the Moscow pageant and revealed that as recently as February, investigators subpoenaed the Russian singer Amin Agalarov, who was involved in planning it. Mr. Agalarov's father, Aras, a billionaire who boasts of close ties to Mr. Putin, was Mr. Trump's partner in the event. You all know all about that, of course. And uh, who knows what else will turn up in this craziness here. We'll continue with this story just a little bit more, at least, if not for the rest of the show, after we come back from the break. Welcome back now to the Keggro in the Morning Show here on Networks Radio. We were digging into this when we uh, left in the, uh, the, the New York Times piece about the tax information that they've gotten on Trump. We were digging into the role of the Agalarovs in the, uh, well, the success, I guess, you'd have to call it, of the Miss Universe pageant in Moscow. And I guess we will find out at some point just how much the generosity or machinations, anyway, of the Agalarovs played in giving Donald Trump one of his few business successes. And then I guess we'll ponder what that means. The committee, uh, that is to say, <clears throat> was it the Senate Intelligence Committee that was looking into this? I think so. The ones that actually subpoenaed the Agalarovs. The committee interviewed a top Miss Universe executive, Paula Shugart, who said the Agalarovs offered to underwrite the event. Their family business, the Crocus Group, paid a $6 million licensing fee and another $6 million in expenses. But while the pageant proved to be a financial loss for the Agalarovs, they recouped only $2 million. Miss Shugart told the investigators that it was one of the most lucrative deals the Miss Universe organization has ever made, according to the report. That is borne out by the tax records. They show that in 2013, the pageant reported $31.6 million in gross receipts, the highest since at least the 1990s, allowing Mr. Trump and his co-owner, NBC, to split profits of $4.7 million. By comparison, Mr. Trump and NBC shared losses of $2 million from the pageant the year before the Moscow event and $3.8 million from, that, uh, from the same event one year after. Interesting. So I guess bottom line on that is that the only time, or at least uh, in that three-year stretch, that Trump and NBC, interestingly enough, made money on the pageant was when the Agalarovs paid him. They just threw six, what, $12 million at the event, and, uh, and that's when Trump made money. So basically the only thing that made his 
pageant profitable during this particular stretch of time was the Aguilarovs, who later call upon him for a favor, you know, including meeting with the Russians to give him dirt. It's interesting. Although, I don't know, maybe the Aguilarovs, I don't know whether they viewed it as a favor. They probably did because, of course, they're connected to Putin and Putin asked, hey, help me compromise Trump. And they said, I think we can do that for you. Um, whereas it's funny because, uh, you know, I'm sure Trump uh, would say that he was the one uh, they were doing. I don't know whether he would admit it. I, it's interesting. Would he admit it? They were doing him a favor by giving him dirt. He has admitted that he wanted the dirt. So he's not embarrassed about that. But ordinarily, like a normal person would say, no, uh, I, they weren't doing me a favor. I didn't want anything from them, especially not dirt on Hillary Clinton. But he loves to brag about it. I don't know. It's a confusing situation because on the one hand, you have somebody handing out money, which is counter to normal business practices, unless you're trying to bribe somebody. But that explains a lot. And on the other hand, the other party to the exchange is an idiot and doesn't uh, know what he's getting into you know, wants very badly to cheat in the election and is happy to accept Russian help to do it. It's, it's, I don't think you could have written this any worse for him. All right. Well, anyway, where were we? Uh, right. So that was the only profitable Miss Universe pageant, at least for those number of years. What's up next? While Mr. Trump crisscrossed the country in 2015, describing himself as uniquely qualified to be president because he was, quote, really rich and had, quote, built a great company. His accountants back in New York were busy putting the finishing touches on his 2014 tax return. After tabulating all the profits and losses for Mr. Trump's various endeavors on Form 1040, the accountants came to line 56, where they had to enter the total income tax the candidate was required to pay. They needed space for only a single figure, zero. For Mr. Trump... That bottom line must have looked familiar. It was the fourth year in a row that he had not paid a penny of federal income taxes. Mr. Trump's avoidance of income taxes is one of the most striking discoveries in his tax returns, especially given the vast wash of income itemized elsewhere in those filings. Mr. Trump's net income from his fame, his 50% share of The Apprentice, together with the riches showered upon him by scores of suitors paying to use his name, totaled $427.4 million through 2018. A further $176.5 million in profit came to him through his investment in two highly successful office buildings. So how did he escape nearly all taxes on that fortune? Even the effective tax rate paid by the wealthiest 1% of Americans could have caused him to pay more than $100 million. The answer rests in a third category of Mr. Trump's endeavors, businesses that he owns and runs himself. The collective and persistent losses he reported from them largely absolved him from paying federal income taxes on the $600 million from the apprentice, branding deals, and investments. Uh, I know he thinks that makes him smart because he doesn't have to pay taxes. Of course, what it means, bottom line, is the businesses that he owns and runs himself personally, or no one else helping or doing anything, are huge, huge losers, apparently, enough to erase all the profits that he's making on $600 million elsewhere. That equation is a key element of the alchemy of Mr. Trump's finances, using the proceeds of his celebrity to purchase and prop up risky businesses, then wielding their losses to avoid taxes. Throughout his career, Mr. Trump's business loans, oh, I'm sorry, businesses Business losses have often accumulated in sums larger than could be used to reduce taxes on other income in a single year, but the tax code offers a workaround. With some restrictions, business owners can carry forward leftover losses to reduce taxes in future years. That provision has been the background music to Mr. Trump's life. As the Times previous reporting on his 1995 return showed, the nearly $1 billion in losses from his early 1990s collapse generated a tax deduction that he could use for up to 18 years going forward. The newer tax returns show that Mr. Trump burned through the last of the tax-reducing power of that $1 billion in 2005, 
just as a torrent of entertainment riches began coming his way following the debut of The Apprentice the year before. For 2005 through 2007, cash from licensing deals and endorsements filled Mr. Trump's bank accounts with $120 million in pure profit. With no prior year losses left to reduce his taxable income, he paid substantial federal income taxes for the first time in his life, a total of $70.1 million. As his celebrity income swelled, Mr. Trump went on a buying spree unlike any he had had since the 1980s, when eager banks and his father's wealth allowed him to buy or build the casinos, airplanes, yacht, and old hotel that would soon lay him low. When The Apprentice premiered, Mr. Trump had opened only two golf courses and was renovating two more. By the end of 2015, he had 15 courses and was transforming the old post office building in Washington into a Trump International Hotel. But rather than making him wealthier, the tax records reveal, as never before, each new acquisition only fed the downward draft on his bottom line. Consider the results at his largest golf resort, Trump National Doral, near Miami. Mr. Trump bought the resort for $150 million in 2012. Through 2018, his losses have totaled $162.3 million. He has pumped $213 million of fresh cash into Doral tax records show and has $125 million mortgage balance coming due in three years on the property. Amazing. Um, as I'm reading it, I'm pondering like, well, how long can you go on flushing all your cash down the toilet and saying, well, I've, I've lost money on stupid investments, so I'm writing it off against money that's coming in. Like, what, aren't you better off taking fabulous riches that are coming in from licensing deals, 600 and something million dollars, and saying, all right, well, that's good, and I also operate some businesses wisely over here on the other side. And uh, I owe a lot of tax money, you know, and I can do some uh, deductions uh, for expenses at the businesses, legitimate expenses. But I'm going to pay some taxes, but I'll be a wealthy person. I'll be building, you know, equity. I'll be fattening my bank accounts. I can invest in some, some stocks and bonds if I want to do that instead of just doing all real estate, whatever. So, you know, doesn't it catch up with you at some point that you're just as a profession, losing money. You're so uh, tax phobic that you'd rather flush all your money down the toilet and claim to have lost it all so that you don't have to pay taxes than just say, yeah, I made some money and here's some for tax. I, I'm not certain that that works out long term, but uh, it occurred to me that what's, you know, what's mostly happening is, well, for one thing, he's more than likely claiming as business expenses things that are really personal expenses, like his entire lifestyle. And of course, his his business model at this point is his lifestyle. I buy uh, golf courses because I like to play golf. And if I own them, I can go and play there anytime I want. And I can, you know, extract cash from the business when I need to. And I can give away, you know, free rounds of golf to people that I owe favors to, or if I need them to extend the payment plan on my loan or whatever, things like that. Or I can give them a complimentary membership, you know, but if I want golf clothes, I steal them from the gift shop. I think that was actually detailed in the story about the, the, uh, the uh, undocumented immigrants who work at the Bedminster golf course uh, whenever that story came out and how every time he ruins his white golf shirts with the makeup uh, running off of his face and down the neck and they leave an orange stain on the shirt that they can't get out. He directs the housekeepers to just go get some more from the pro shop. I mean, he just outfits himself from the stock in the, in the shop and then just says oh, business losses, you know, call it a shoplifting, whatever, but, but write it off. And I think that he just, finances a lifestyle that way. If I need a, a golden golf cart for myself at Doral, I buy it and charge it to, you know, I make the club buy it. This is part of my image, part of my lifestyle. People want to see Donald Trump. They want to, they play golf at a Trump property because of the glitz and glamour. And I've got to have a gold golf cart to add to that. That's what people have come to see. And you know, it's funny. That's the sort of thing that we've discussed the stupid, you know, business practice rule or the whatever the hell I can't even remember anymore but uh 
how you can get away with making gigantic mistakes that sink your business and still not be liable to the shareholders or other stakeholders in uh, for them because look uh, we made a business decision and it was a bad one so you know what can you do you got to be free to make business decisions and for him you know he's i made a million of them all i make is bad business decisions uh but it they're all lifestyle enhancements for him and you know you don't have to itemize them so you just lump them together and say mm, i needed 50 million dollars worth of you know whatever the hell uh, uh Pokemon cards, whatever. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, but you make the Doral Resort buy it. And the argument, if you even have one anymore with your accountant, and I guess later with the IRS, if they get the tails on the stuff, uh, is uh, I needed to finance a lavish looking lifestyle that's part of the image of the Trump brand. And you can you actually very often get away with dumb stuff like this. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's what it is, is he just uh, he's learned that uh, he, can, he can get it back out of the taxes. You're not going to owe a hundred million dollars in taxes. So that's a hundred million dollars more for you to play with around here. And when you just treat every one of your businesses as a personal piggy bank and intimidate all of your accountants and other, you know, bean counters along the way. Listen, this is the Trump empire and this is what Trump wants. And you just get out of the way. And if you don't write it up as an expense, I'll find someone else who will. Then I guess it works. Uh, but you'd think that it hit a brick wall at some point. And I guess when these loans come due, that's that's when it happens. I don't know. But I guess if he thinks uh, you can't come after me for loans while I'm president, I, I don't know how he tests that theory. I mean, ordinarily, I'd be like, no, that <laughs> that doesn't work. And you're going to end up going to jail at some point. But, you know, uh, maybe Justice Barrett doesn't think so. Hmm. I don't know. You get enough votes to say no and uh, you win by cheating. That's just, I guess that's what we have to look forward to. All right. Where were we? Oh, yes. Right. So Doral was where he was dumping all his cash. Uh, and there too, you know, oh, well, I'm improving it. I'm, uh, you know, I'm building it into the most lavish resort ever. Uh, but again, that's lifestyle thing for him. He gets to drive around and play uh, there all the time and enjoy all the benefits of everything. There has to be caviar and champagne flowing at all times and he'll drink it all. But, you know, he says he doesn't drink, whatever. But, you know, oh, it's a business expense. Uh, what kind of business expense is that just handing out caviar to people who have come there to play golf for the day. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you've heard the news, but I'm an idiot businessman. I lose money left and right. I'm very, very stupid. Oh, well, you have us there. So, okay. Anyway, the important point on Doral is there's a $125 million mortgage on it. And the balance is coming due in three years. His three courses in Europe, two in Scotland and one in Ireland have reported a combined $63.6 million in losses Overall, since 2000, Mr. Trump has reported losses of 315,000, I'm sorry, 315.6 million dollars, million dollars at the golf courses that are his prized possessions. For all of its Trump world allure, his Washington hotel, opened in 2016, has not fared much better. Its tax records show losses through 2018 of 55.5 million dollars. And Trump Corporation, the real estate services company, has reported losing $134 million since 2000. Mr. Trump personally bankrolled the losses year after year, marking his cash infusions as a loan with an ever-increasing balance, his tax records show. Oh, that's interesting, too. In 2016, he gave up on getting paid back and turned the loan into a cash contribution. Mr. Trump has often posited that his losses are more accounting magic than actual money out the door because of course he consumes it as a you know a, an ostensible patron of these golf courses and hotels he goes there and eats for free and outfits himself for free and uh paves it in you know gold for free and eats the caviar and hands out free rounds and, you know so he's the impresario of the place um and uh, all right, well, it's interesting, though. He bankrolls it from personal funds and I guess then writes that off against 
his personal income taxes later on when he forgives the loan to himself. Let's see, where were we? Last year, after the Times published details of his tax returns from the 1980s and 1990s, he attributed the red ink to depreciation, which he said in a tweet would show losses in almost all cases and that much was non-monetary. I love depreciation, Mr. Trump said during a presidential debate in 2016. That's because you can mostly lie about it. However, they explain here, depreciation, though, is not a magic wand like he thinks it is. It involves real money spent or borrowed to buy buildings or other assets that are expected to last years. But remember, though, this is the guy who thinks China is paying the tariffs and that testing causes COVID. So I don't know how well he's going to understand what depreciation is supposed to be. He knows how he uses it like a magic wand. Those costs, they go on to explain, must be spread out as expenses and deducted over the useful life of the asset. Even so, the rules do hold particular advantages for real estate developers like Mr. Trump, who are allowed to use their real estate losses to reduce their taxable income from other activities. What the tax records for Mr. Trump's businesses show, however, is that he has lost chunks of his fortune even before depreciation is figured in. The three European, European golf courses... The Washington Hotel, Doral, and Trump Corporation reported losing a total of $150.3 million from 2010 through 2018 without including depreciation as an expense. To see what a successful business looks like, depreciation or not, you got to look elsewhere. Oh, look no further than one, anyway, in Mr. Trump's portfolio that he does not manage. There's the answer. After plans for a Trump-branded mini-city on the far west side of Manhattan stalled in the 1990s, Mr. Trump's stake was sold by his partner to, we hear this name a lot, Vornado Realty Trust. Why did they just come up the other day? Some other dirty crap, right? Was it with respect to Cutter at the time, too? Mr. Trump objected to the sale in court saying he had not been consulted, but he ended up with a 30% share of two valuable office buildings owned and operated by Vornado. His share of the profits through the end of 2018 totaled $176.5 million, with depreciation factored in. He has never had to invest more money in the partnership, tax records show. Among businesses he runs, Mr. Trump's first success remains his best, the retail and commercial spaces at Trump Tower, completed in 1983, have reliably delivered more than $20 million a year in profits, a total of $336.3 million since 2000 that has done much to keep him afloat. Mr. Trump has an established track record of stiffing his lenders, but the tax returns reveal that he has failed to pay back far more money than previously known, a total of $287 million since 2010. I almost forgot about that aspect of things. Borrow and borrow and borrow and then tell them to F off. And if they want any money, you'll give them 10 cents on the dollar and they'll be happy to take it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Declare bankruptcy, walk away, shift the losses to another division, whatever. The IRS considers debt forgiven to be income. But Mr. Trump was able to avoid taxes on much of that money by reducing his ability to declare future business losses. Okay, for the rest, he took advantage of a provision of the Great Recession bailout that allowed income from canceled debt to be completely deferred for five years, then spread out evenly over the next five. He declared the first $28.2 million in 2014. Once again, his business losses mostly absolved his tax responsibilities, and he paid no federal income taxes for 2014. Mr. Trump was periodically required to pay a parallel income tax called the Alternative Minimum Tax, created as a tripwire to prevent wealthy people from using huge deductions, including business losses, to entirely wipe out their tax liabilities. Mr. Trump paid Alternative Minimum Tax in seven years between 2000 and 2017, a total of $24.3 million, excluding refunds that he received after filing. For 2015, he paid $641,931, 
his first payment of any federal income tax since 2010. As he settled into the Oval Office, his tax bills soon returned to form. His potential taxable income in 2016 and 17 included $24.8 million in profits from sources related to his celebrity status and $56.4 million for the loans he did not repay. The dreaded alternative minimum tax would let his business losses erase only some of his liability. Each time he requested an extension to file his 1040, and each time he made the required payment to the IRS for income taxes he might owe, $1 million for 2016 and $4.2 million for 2017. But virtually all of that liability was washed away when he eventually filed, and most of the payments were rolled forward to cover potential taxes in future years. To cancel out the tax bills, Mr. Trump made use of $9.7 million in business investment credits, at least some of which related to his renovation of the old post office hotel, which qualified for a historic preservation tax break. Although he had more than enough credits to owe no taxes at all, his accountants appear to have carved out an allowance for a small tax liability for both 2016 and 2017. When they got to line 56, the one for income taxes due, the amount was the same each year, $750. Now, next up, a section called the $72.9 million Maneuver. It says here, the as uh, sort of a subheader to this subheader, The Apprentice created what was probably the biggest income tax bite of Mr. Trump's life. During the Great Recession bailout, he asked for the money back. Hmm. Testifying before Congress, in February of 2019, the president's estranged personal lawyer, Mr. Cohen, recalled Mr. Trump showing him a huge check from the U.S. Treasury some years earlier and musing, quote, that he could not believe how stupid the government was for giving someone like him that much money back. Hmm, that does feel stupid. In fact, confidential records show that starting in 2010, he claimed and received an income tax refund totaling $72.9 million. All the federal income tax he had paid for 2005 through 2008 plus interest. The legitimacy of that refund is at the center of the audit battle that has lo he has long been waging out of public view with the IRS. The records that the Times reviewed square with the way Mr. Trump has repeatedly cited, without explanation, an ongoing audit as grounds for refusing to release his tax returns. He alluded to it as recently as July on Fox News when he told Sean Hannity, they treat me horribly, the IRS horribly. And while the records do not lay out all the details of the audit, they match his lawyer's statement during the 2016 campaign that audits of his returns for 2009 and subsequent years remained open and involved, quote, transactions or activities that were also reported on returns for 2008 and earlier. Mr. Trump harvested that refund bonanza by declaring huge business losses, a total of $1.4 billion from his core businesses for 2008 and 2009 that tax laws had prevented him from using in prior years. But to turn that long arc of failure into a giant refund check, he relied on some deft accounting footwork <laughs> and an unwitting gift from an unlikely source, Mr. Obama. Businesses, uh, business losses can work like a tax avoidance coupon. A dollar lost on one business reduces a dollar of taxable income from elsewhere. The types and amounts of income that can be used in a given year vary depending on an owner's tax status. But some losses can be saved for later use or even used to request a refund on taxes paid in a prior year. Until 2009, those coupons could be used to wipe away taxes going back only two years. But that November, the window was more than doubled by a little notice provision in a bill Mr. Obama signed as part of the Great Recession recovery effort. Now, business owners could request full refunds of taxes paid in the prior four years, and 50% of those from the year before that. Mr. Trump had paid no income taxes in 2008, but the change meant that when he filed his taxes for 2009, 
he could seek a refund of not just the $13.3 million he had paid in 2007, but also the combined $56.9 million paid in 2005 and 2006 when The Apprentice created what was likely the biggest income tax bite of his life. Wow, that is amazing. Wow, I mean, it's, I, I, I recall when the uh, the proposals were being made for uh, tax provisions. I mean, I don't think I noticed this one. This was, after all, a little noticed provision. But the various provisions in the in the uh, Recovery Act that uh, did occasionally. I mean, I think people pointed to things that they threatened to give away huge chunks of money to you know to millionaires and billionaires. And people said, you know, uh, it's true. Some people who really don't deserve it are going to get some money. I don't know whether they thought it would trickle down or whatever, but. Uh, I don't think anybody envisioned this one. Boy. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. Into our last segment, this is a huge article. And uh, this may be, like I said, this may be it for the rest of the day. But uh, I don't know. Uh, hopefully you haven't read the article yet. And this is doing you a service running through this and, uh, and or explaining things as we go along in case things aren't clear. I don't know that I've made everything clear. There are definitely some things that still confuse me. Uh, this episode. For instance. All right. So where were we? The records reviewed by the Times indicate that Mr. Trump filed for the first of several tranches of his refund several weeks later in January of 2010. That set off what tax professionals refer to as a quickie refund, a check processed in 90 days on a tentative basis pending an audit by the IRS. His total federal income tax refund would eventually grow to $70.1 million plus $2,733,184 $2,733,184 in interest. He also received $21.2 million in state and local refunds, which often piggyback on federal filings. Whether Mr. Trump gets to keep the cash, though, remains far from a sure thing, because, of course, it was pretty much uh, a lie, and he was cheating the whole time, and eventually they'll find that out. But what an interesting situation. As I was saying just before the break, uh, a lot of times in things like this or bailout situations or uh, even uh, in the uh, COVID relief situation where we're saying, look, money has to be gotten out into the economy to help us recover. Some rich people will get money they don't deserve, but it's got to happen. Let's go. But this is like a huge, huge abuse of it. And, uh, you know, IRS reserves the right to audit and claw it back. So they ought to do it. Uh, and I guess if he figures as long as he's president, it can't happen. We'll see. Uh, Let's see. Refunds require, of course, the approval of IRS auditors and an opinion of the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation, a bipartisan panel better known for reviewing the impact of tax legislation. Tax law requires the committee to weigh in on all refunds larger than $2 million to individuals. That is not a role I knew that they had. Records show that the results of an audit of Mr. Trump's refund were sent to the Joint Committee in the spring of 2011. An agreement was reached in late 2014, the documents indicate, but the audit resumed and grew to include Mr. Trump's returns for 2010 through 2013. In the spring of 2016, with Mr. Trump closing in on the Republican nomination, the case was sent back to the committee. It had remained there, has remained there, unresolved with the statute of limitations repeatedly pushed forward. Because you can't do it to him, I guess, while he's a sitting president. Precisely why the case has stalled is not clear. Republicans won't agree to anything. 
But experts say it suggests that the gap between the sides remains wide. If negotiations were to deadlock, the case would move to federal court, where it could become a matter of public record. The dispute may center on a single claim that jumps off the page of Mr. Trump's 2009 tax return, a declaration of more than $700 million in business losses that he had not been allowed to use in prior years. Unleashing that giant tax avoidance coupon enabled him to receive some or all of his refund. The material obtained by the Times does not identify the business or businesses that generated those losses, but the losses were a kind that can be claimed only when partners give up their interest in a business. And in 2009, Mr. Trump parted ways with a giant money loser, his long-failing Atlantic City casinos. After Mr. Trump's bondholders rebuffed his offer to buy them out, and with a third round of bankruptcy only a week away, Mr. Trump announced in February of 2009 that he was quitting the board of directors. If I'm not going to run it, I don't want to be involved in it, he told the Associated Press. I'm one of the largest developers in the world. I have a lot of cash and plenty of places I can go. The same day, he notified the Securities and Exchange Commission that he had, quote, determined that his partnership interests are worthless, because he has so much money, and lack potential to regain value, because he's such a great developer, and was hereby abandoning his stake. The language was crucial. Mr. Trump was using the precise wording of IRS rules governing the most beneficial and perhaps aggressive method for business owners to avoid taxes when separating from a business. A partner who walks away from a business with nothing, what tax laws refer to as abandonment, can suddenly declare all the losses on the business that could not be used in prior years. But there are a few catches, including this. Abandonment is essentially an all-or-nothing proposition. If the IRS learns that the owner received anything of value, the allowable losses are reduced to just $3,000 a year. And Mr. Trump does appear to have received something, doesn't he? When the casino bankruptcy concluded, he got 5% of the stock in the new company. The materials reviewed by the Times did not make clear whether Mr. Trump's refund application reflected his public declaration of abandonment. If it did, that 5% could place his entire refund in question. If the auditors ultimately disallow Trump's $72.9 million in federal refunds, he will be forced to return that money with interest and possibly penalties, a total that could exceed $100 million. He could also be ordered to return the state and local refunds based on the same claims. In response to a question about the audit, Mr. Garten, the Trump Organization lawyer, said facts cited by the Times were incorrect, without citing specifics. He did, however, write that it was illogical to say Mr. Trump had not paid taxes for those three years just because the money was later refunded. When you claim that President Trump paid no taxes in 10 of the 15 previous years, Mr. Garden said, you also assert that President Trump claimed a massive refund for tens of millions of it for taxes he did pay. Those two claims are entirely inconsistent and in any event, not supported by the facts. Hmm. House Democrats who have been in hot pursuit of Mr. Trump's tax returns most likely have no idea that at least some of the records are sitting in a congressional office building. George Yin, a former chief of staff for the Joint Committee, said that any identifying information about taxpayers under review was tightly held among a handful of staff lawyers and was rarely shared with politicians assigned to the committee. It is possible that the case has been paused because Mr. Trump is president, which would raise the personal stakes of re-election. If the recent Fox interview is any indication, Mr. Trump seems increasingly agitated about the matter. It's a disgrace what happened, he told Mr. Hannity. We had a deal done. In fact, it was, I guess it was signed even. And once I ran, or once I won, or somewhere back a long time ago, whatever, when I was a banana, and I, I, I don't, what the hell is he saying? Once I ran, or once I won, or some other kind of time, it was a long time ago, everything was like, well, let's start all over again. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace that you can't even describe it. All right, next up, the 20% solution. 
helping to reduce Mr. Trump's tax bills are unidentified consultants' fees, some of which can be matched to payments received by Ivanka Trump. You knew she was involved in this somehow. Examining the Trump Organization's tax records, a curious pattern emerges. Between 2010 and 2018, Mr. Trump wrote off some $26 million in unexplained, quote, consulting fees as a business expense across nearly all of his projects. In most cases, the fees were roughly one-fifth of his income. In Azerbaijan, Mr. Trump collected $5 million on a hotel deal and reported $1.1 $1.1 million in consulting fees, while in Dubai it was $3 million with a $630,000 fee and so on. Mysterious big payments in business deals can cause red flags, particularly in places where bribes or kickbacks to middlemen are routine. But there is no evidence that Mr. Trump, who mostly licenses his name to other people's projects and is not involved in securing government approvals, has engaged in such practices. Rather, there appears to be a closer-to-home explanation for at least some of the fees. Mr. Trump reduced his taxable income by treating a family member as a consultant and then deducting the fee as a cost of doing business, as opposed to being a gift to her, right? The consultants are not identified in the tax records, but evidence of this arrangement was gleaned by comparing the confidential tax records to the financial disclosures Ivanka Trump filed when she joined the White House staff in 2017. Ms. Trump reported receiving payments from a consulting company she co-owned, totaling $747,622. That exactly matched consulting fees claimed as tax deductions by the Trump Organization for hotel projects in Vancouver and Hawaii. Wow, that's so weird. Mrs. Oh, Ms. Trump has been an executive officer of the Trump companies that received profits from and paid the consulting fees for both projects, meaning she appears to have been treated as a consultant on the same hotel deals that she helped manage as part of her job at her father's business. When asked about the arrangement, the Trump Organization lawyer, Mr. Garten, did not comment. Employers can deduct consulting fees as a business expense and also avoid the withholding taxes that apply to wages. To claim the deduction, the consulting arrangement must be an, quote, ordinary and necessary part of running the business with fees that are reasonable and market-based, according to the IRS, the recipient of the fees is still required to pay income taxes. The IRS has pursued civil penalties against some business owners who devised schemes to avoid taxes by paying exorbitant fees to related parties who were not, in fact, independent contractors. A 2011 tax court case centered on the IRS's denial of almost $3 million in deductions for consulting fees. The partners in an Illinois accounting firm paid themselves via corporations they created. The court concluded that the partners had structured the fees to, quote, distribute profits, not to compensate for services. There is no indication that the IRS has questioned Mr. Trump's practice of deducting millions of dollars in consulting fees. If the payments to his daughter were compensation for work, it is not clear why Mr. Trump would do it in this form other than to reduce his own tax liability. Another, more legally perilous possibility is that the fees were a way to transfer assets to his children without incurring a tax gift. A Times investigation in 2018 found that Mr. Trump's late father, Fred Trump, employed a number of legally dubious schemes decades ago to evade gift taxes on millions of dollars he transferred to his children. It is not possible to discern from this newer collection of tax records whether intrafamily financial maneuverings were a motivating factor. But there are some weird coincidences, let's say that. However, the fact that some of the consulting fees are identical, that's the one I was thinking of, to those reported by Mr. Trump's daughter raises the question of whether this was a mechanism the president used to compensate his adult children involved in his businesses. Indeed, in some instances where large fees were claimed, people with direct knowledge of the projects were not aware of any outside consultants who would have been paid. On the failed hotel deal in Azerbaijan, which was plagued by uh, suspicions of corruption uh, and involved uh, the uh, Iranian uh, uh, Revolutionary Guard, right? A Trump Organization lawyer 
told the New Yorker the company was blameless because it was merely a licensor and had no substantive role, adding, we did not pay any money to anyone. Yet the tax records for three Trump LLCs involved in that project show deductions for consulting fees, totaling $1.1 million. They were paid to someone. In Turkey, a person directly involved in developing two towers in Istanbul expressed bafflement when asked about consultants on the project, telling the Times that there was never any consultant or any other third party in Turkey paid by the Trump Organization. But tax records show regular deductions for consulting fees over seven years, totaling $2 million. Ms. Trump disclosed in her public filing that the fees she received were paid through TTT Consulting LLC, which she said provided consulting, licensing, and management services for real estate projects, which is what her dad does. Incorporated in Delaware in December of 2005, the firm is one of several Trump-related entities with some variation of TTT, or TTTT, four T's, in the name that appear to refer to members of the Trump family. Like her brothers Donald Jr. and Eric, Ms. Trump was a longtime employee of the Trump Organization and an executive officer for more than 200 Trump companies that licensed or managed hotel and resort properties. The tax records show that the three siblings each had drawn a salary from their father's company, roughly $480,000 a year, jumping to about $2 million after Mr. Trump became president, though Ms. Trump no longer receives a salary. What's more, Ms. Trump has said the children were intimately, oh, Mr. Trump has said the children were intimately involved in negotiating and managing his projects. When asked in 2011 in a lawsuit deposition whom he relied on to handle important details of his licensing deals, he named only Ivanka, Donald Jr., and Eric. So, of course, that would throw their role as actual bona fide consultants into question. And I imagine TTT or TTTT in the name, uh, Trump, 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 and Trump, 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 and Trump, if you include, I don't know, did throw Barron in there or Tiffany? Who's the fourth T there? On Ms. Trump's now defunct website, which explains her role at the Trump Organization, she was not identified as a consultant. Rather, she has been described as a senior executive who, quote, actively participates in all aspects of both Trump and Trump-branded projects, including deal evaluation, pre-development planning, financing, design, construction, sales, and marketing, and ensuring that Trump's world-renowned physical and operational standards are met. She is involved in all decisions, large and small. And that'll usually come back and bite you in the ass eventually. Next up, the art of the write-off. Hairstylists, table linens, Property taxes on a family estate all have been deducted as business expenses. I think we previewed this. Private jets, country clubs, and mansions have all had a role in the selling of Donald Trump. I play to people's fantasies, he wrote in Trump, the art of the deal. He didn't write that, but anyway. People want to believe that something is the biggest and the greatest and the most spectacular. I call it truthful hyperbole. It's an innocent form of exaggeration and a very effective form of promotion. If the singular Trump product is Trump in an exaggerated form, the man, the lifestyle, the acquisitiveness, then everything that feeds the image, including the cost of his businesses, can be written off on his taxes. Gold toilets, gold golf carts, like we said, caviar, champagne. Mr. Trump may be reporting business losses to the government, but he can still live a life of wealth and write it off. I guess we figured this out before we even got here. Take, for example, Pervalago, Mar-a-Lago. Now the president's permanent residence, we'll see about that, uh, what what West Palm Beach or Palm Beach has to say about that, rather, Uh, as well as a private club and a stage set on which Trump's luxury plays out. As a business, it is also the source of millions of dollars in expenses deducted from taxable income, among them $109,433 for linens and silver and $197,829 for landscaping in 2017. Also deducted as a business expense was the $210,000 paid to a Florida photographer over the years for shooting numerous events at the club, including a 2016 New Year's Eve party, hosted by Mr. Trump. 
Mr. Trump has written off as business expense costs, including uh, fuel and meals associated with his aircraft used to shuttle him among his various homes and properties. Likewise, the cost of haircuts, if you can believe he's getting that done, including more the more than $70,000 paid to style his hair during The Apprentice. Together, nine Trump entities have written off at least $95,464 paid to a favorite hair and makeup artist of Ivanka Trump. In allowing business expenses to be deducted, the IRS requires that they be ordinary and necessary. A loosely defined standard, often interpreted generously by business owners. Perhaps Mr. Trump's most generous interpretation of the business expense write-off is his treatment of the Seven Springs Estate in Westchester County, New York. That came up the other day. Seven Springs is a throwback to another era. The main house, built in 1919 by Eugene I. Myered, Meyer Incorporated, the one-time head of the Federal Reserve who bought the Washington Post in 1933, sits on more than 200 acres of lush, almost untouched land just an hour's drive north of New York City. The mansion is a 50,000-square-foot building, has three pools, three pools, carriage houses, and is surrounded by nature preserves, according to the Trump Organization website. Mr. Trump had big plans when he bought the property in 1996, a golf course, a clubhouse, and 15 private homes. The residents of surrounding towns thwarted his ambitions, arguing that development would draw too much traffic and risk polluting the drinking water. They're right, but uh, a lot of NIMBY stuff going on up there. Anyway, Mr. Trump instead found a way to reap tax benefits from the estate. He took advantage of what is known as a conservation easement. In 2015, he signed a deal with the Land Conservancy, agreeing not to develop most of the property. And in exchange, he claimed a $21.1 million charitable tax deduction. Okay. The tax records reveal another way Seven Springs has generated substantial tax savings. In 2014, Mr. Trump classified the estate as an investment property, as distinct from a personal residence. Since then, he has written off $2.2 million in property taxes as a business expense, even as his 2017 tax law allowed individuals to write off only $10,000 in property taxes a year. You see, if he owned it as his own house and he owed $2.2 million in property taxes, his own tax bill would only have allowed him to take ten grand, not $2.2 million. But if it's a business expense because it's an investment property, Boom. Done. Courts have held that to treat residences as businesses for tax purposes, owners must show that they have an actual and honest objective of making a profit, typically by making substantial efforts to rent the property and eventually generating income. Whether or not Seven Springs fits those criteria, the Trumps have described the property somewhat differently. In 2014, Eric Trump told Forbes that, quote, this is really our compound. Growing up, he and his brother Donald Jr. spent many summers there, riding all-terrain vehicles and fishing on a nearby lake. At one point, the brothers took up residence in a carriage house on the property. It was home base for us for a long, long time, Eric told Forbes. And the Trump Organization website still describes Seven Springs as a, quote, retreat for the Trump family. Mr. Garten, the Trump Organization lawyer, did not respond to questions about Seven Springs write-off. The Seven Springs conservation easement deduction is one of four that Mr. Trump has claimed over the years. While his use of these deductions is widely known, his tax records show that they represent the lion's share of his charitable giving. About $119.3 million of the roughly $130 million in personal and corporate charitable contributions reported to the IRS. Huh. So the vast majority of all his charitable giving is preserving the green space around his getaway. Well, the one he puts his kids in anyway. He goes to Pervilago. Two of those deductions at Seven Springs and at the Trump National Golf Club in Los Angeles are the focus of an investigation by the New York Attorney General, who is examining whether the appraisals on the land and therefore the tax deductions were inflated. Another common deductible expense for all businesses is legal fees. The IRS requires that these fees be directly related to operating your business 
and businesses cannot deduct legal fees paid to defend charges that arise from participation in a political campaign. Yet, the tax records show that the Trump Corporation wrote off as business expenses fees paid to a criminal defense lawyer, Alan Futterfuss, you know him, who was hired to represent Donald Trump Jr. during the Russia inquiry. Investigators were examining Donald Jr.'s role in the 2016 Trump Tower meeting with Russians who had promised damaging information on Mrs. Clinton. When he testified before Congress in 2017, Mr. Futterfuss was by his side. Futterfuss was also hired to defend the president's embattled Charitable Foundation, which would be shut down in 2018 after New York regulators said it was engaged in a shocking pattern of illegality. The Trump Corporation paid Mr. Futterfuss at least $1.9 million in 2017 and 18, tax records show, also written off, was at least $259,684 paid to Williams & Jensen, another law firm brought in during the same period to represent Donald Trump Jr. Wowee. Now, how much time do we have left here? I am not sure. Let's check the clock and see what we can cram in before departing for the day. Well, there's still an awful lot left in this article that I think is important and we ought to read, but uh, we are going to run out of time if I try to continue on with this. Instead, what if I switch gears and try and cram in this very interesting article that I thought you might want to, uh, you might be interested in? Uh, something I found in Medium.com. I lived through collapse. America is already there. How life goes on, surrounded by death. I thought this was an interesting approach to, well, everything, really. Written by someone by the name of Indy Samara, Samara Jiva. I hope I've got that even close to correct. But check this out. Uh, living in Sri Lanka and describing what life was like there during and after the Civil War there. It starts out this way. I lived through the end of a Civil War. Do you know what it was like for me? Quite normal. I went to work. I went out. I dated. This is what Americans don't understand. They're waiting to get personally punched in the face while ash falls from the sky. That's not how this happens. This is how it happens. Precisely what you're feeling now. The numbing litany of bad news, the ever-rising outrages, people suffering, dying, and protesting all around you while you think about dinner. If you're trying to carry on while people around you die, your society is not collapsing, it's already fallen down. I was looking, he says, through some old photos for this article, and the mix is shocking to me now, almost offensive. There's a burnt body in front of my office. Then I'm playing Scrabble with friends. There's bomb smoke rising in front of the mall. Then I'm at a concert. Long line for gas. Then I'm at a nightclub. This is all within two weeks. Today, I'm like, did we live like this? But we did. I mean, I did. Was I a rich Columbo, well, as he says, F boy, while poorer people died? Well, yes, I wrote about it, but who cares? The real question is, who are you? I mean, you're reading this. You have the leisure to ponder American collapse like it's even a question. The People really experiencing it already know. So I'm telling you, as someone who's been there in similar shoes to yours, this is it. America has already collapsed. What you're feeling is exactly how it feels. It's Saturday, that was when this came out, and you're thinking about food while the world is on fire. This is normal. This is life during collapse. Just read what it says on the tin. Life now with 20% more death. Collapse does not mean you're personally dying right now. It means y'all are dying right now. Death is sometimes close, sometimes far away, but always there. Usually for somebody else, but someday randomly for you. I used to judge those herds of gazelle when the lion eats just one of them alive and everyone just keeps going. But no, humans are just like that. That's the real meaning of herd immunity. We're immune to fundamentally giving a crap, let's just say. It honestly becomes mundane, for the privileged, anyway. Uh, as Columbo kids, we used to go out, worry about money, fall in love. It all went on. We'd pop the trunk for a bomb check, turn off our lights for the air raids. I'm not saying we were untouched. My dad's friend was killed, just gone with a landmine. I know people who were beaten, arrested, went into exile. But that's not what my photo stream looks like. It was mostly food and parties and normal stuff for a dumb 20-something. If you're waiting for a moment when you're like, this is it, 
I'm telling you, it never comes. This is fascinating, don't you think? Nobody comes on TV and says, things are officially bad. There's no launch party for decay. It's just a pile up of outrages and atrocities between, in between friendships and weddings and perhaps an unusual amount of alcohol. Perhaps you're waiting for some moment when the adrenaline kicks in and you're fighting the virus or fascism all the time, but it's not like that. Life is not a movie, and if it was, you're certainly not the star, you're just an extra. If something good or bad happens to you, it'll be random and no one will care. If you're unlucky, you'll be a statistic. If you're lucky, no one notices you at all. Collapse is just a series of ordinary days in between extraordinary BS. Most of it happening to someone else. That's all it is. Just like one day I was working when somebody left a bomb at the bag check at no limit. It exploded, killing 17 people who were out shopping. I experienced this as the phone lines getting clogged for an hour. My wife experienced it as, well, a bomb. It was 500 meters from her house. 17 families experienced it as the end. And their grief goes on. As you can see, this is not a uniform experience of chaos. For some people, it destroys their bodies, others their hearts. But for most people, it's just a low-level hum in the back of their minds. From Daily Coast Radio. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Group in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Really fascinating. Skipping ahead just to the ending, just because I want to wrap it up. In the last three months, America has lost more people than Sri Lanka lost in 30 years of civil war. If this isn't collapsed, then the word has no meaning. You probably still think of Sri Lanka as an asshole. That war ended over a decade ago, and we're fine. What does that make you?